So how did this program come to be? Well, uh, about nine years ago, John McFarlane uh, came and presented the story of Sonos. It was only at that point about uh, four, four years old. And uh, so I went to John and said, you know, an update, it would be interesting, et cetera. And he agreed to do it, but he said, I think there's something that would be a lot more interesting, and that's to talk about what's happening in the industry more broadly, particularly the things that are happening now and what that's going to mean. So to our program. On August 12th, NPR had a little story about Columbia House. Some of you may remember it was sort of the book of the month club of records. Every month you'd get records from Columbia House. At its peak, its revenue was $1.7 billion a year. Last year it did $17 million, and this year it's bankrupt. I think it's a, <clears throat> a reasonable uh, stand-in for the kind of changes that have occurred. They were, if you remember, doing vinyl. I don't know if you can get to the first slide. Let's see how this works. This is a quick look, and these are not necessarily comparable, but the red thing is what's happened in terms of digital delivery of music. It's all been pretty recent. This is what's happened to revenue over the same time frame, the last, uh, basically the decade that ended in 2009. And this gives you an indication of units, if you will, of music, and how uh, the purple thing toward the right is the digital part, and what's happened to the revenue to the industry. Obviously, there's been a lot of pain, and the digital part doesn't seem to be generating a whole lot of revenue. So that's, that's what this is all about. And in this world of streaming, the questions are who's, who's gaining and who's not, or who will be. I think we mostly agree that consumers are getting a deal. The record labels, they probably are. It's harder, harder for us to know that. These guys know this sort of stuff. The artists are definitely not getting as good a deal. The digital distributors, plus minus, there was an article, or I guess a thing by the Motley Fool a couple days ago about how Pandora and Spotify can never make money no matter how big they get. Um, and then ultimately there's uh, the audio makers like Sonos. At the end of the day, you have to be able to hear the stuff. And in general, they've probably done a little better. And if you throw in automotive, there's some real opportunity there too. So I'm going to introduce Mark Geiger to talk uh, we're kind of following the electrons. Mark is involved with the artists and the creative processes. Then we will have Tom from Pandora involved with delivering the electrons. And finally, Sonos involved with making it so you can hear them. Hi, I'm Mark Geiger. I run the uh, music part. I run one of the biggest talent agencies in the world for music. I'm the global head of music, but I'm actually a recovering dot-com CEO, which is why they invited me. Uh, I took my old company, Artist Direct Public, the day the market crashed in 2000, and ever since then, um, I've been fat, pre that and after that. While I'm in the content businesses now, I'm fascinated with the reconstruction of our business and ultimately all the media businesses. Just to give you an example, uh, two weeks ago, they released a statistic that there were one trillion songs streamed in the first six months of this year. It's the most consumed anything other than communication on the entire internet, mobile, blah, blah. It's not even, nothing's even close. So a trillion tracks in six months. So when they talk about not being able to make money, it's just not being able to monetize it properly, but the, the consumption's already there, and that's quite unique. Um, the other thing was I was at the Video Music Awards. They were terrible, but... Um, <laughs> When Taylor Swift was accepting her award, she said something unique. And she said, hey, I just want to thank my fans for watching this video that won the award. You guys watched it a billion times. And if you grew up in any part of our business, those numbers never existed. A gold record was a million, platinum record was a million sold, and it was huge, right? Michael Jackson sold 20, 50 million record, whatever. So these are, we're in an unprecedented time of scale. Anyway, on the left, uh, are what I'd call the giants. And the giants are anybody with roughly 100 million customers to a billion customers. Kind of, uh, those numbers are unprecedented. When we all grew up, Walmart was the biggest. Hard to compare to iTunes, 700 million credit cards, whatever. We're, we're in a, all of these companies are enormous and they have enormous reach. One thing to note about them, and this is from a previous presentation, but I think it's worth bringing up. 
These are the biggest, most influential companies in the music industry today. 15 years ago, none of them existed, and the giants were a completely different set of companies. Bud knows this, okay? Completely different from Viacom and MTV and Tower Records and da da So the other thing to remember when we're talking about this is the entire industry and all the companies literally got decimated, wiped out. Imagine the whole city, every building's gone and replaced with all new companies. So it, within the things I just in the last two slides, that happened also, all right? And then in smaller roles, there's some of the companies on the right. We'll see what happens with all of them, but it's not really that important. Important. Ultimately, they all have their own path, and they're all going to figure out what to do. As we enter this 21st year of the war, the storm clouds brew over the landscape as the giants trudge onto the field. They bring with them other services and armies of video, film, TV, video games, books, and more, i.e. Amazon Prime, Google Play, etc. Okay, so it's not just Spotify, Pandora, and more, creating further blended subscription offerings and hard-to-understand pricing. They also bring a host of other businesses which make this war seem quite petite. Apple Pay, Android Pay, operating system, etc., and insignificant to these giants while millions of music hungry stare at the music equivalents of Godzilla, King Kong, and Mothra, hoping they give a damn and make a good product. One thing's for certain, for both consumers and content suppliers, confusion runs amok. The battles over who has true power to scale users using their weaponry of 100 million to a billion plus audiences, internal payment systems, and blended billing, the giants hope to convert their loyal minions to pay fees for a variety of content services. You guys have to explain who King Kong and Mothra is to the kids as well. <clears throat> Here's a snapshot of what's still to be figured out. And part of why I say this is it's early. It's early still. Um, I've been doing this 24 years in the digital business, and I tell people, Two years ago, they just came out of the locker room and onto the field. So it shows you sort of where we're at. Okay, content libraries are still evolving. Sometimes you go into Spotify, you request an artist that you love, and nothing's there. Pricing, we're still in the great freemium era because we don't believe that $10 a month for all the music in the world is a good deal, yet you all pay $180 for your cable, and you don't watch it, and you watch Netflix and Apple TV, and you pay additional because your cable sucks, and $10 is too much, so and there's no new release tier, so Taylor Swift doesn't put her album in there, and there's no high res, and blah, blah, blah. So we're still in our early days. Um, most of the services, Spotify just recently, I was busting their balls in a meeting, because I went to new releases, and I would look down, there were 72 Mozart and Beethoven re-releases before you got to the new Drake album, and it wasn't really that great. Um, anyway, the metadata cleanup, it's still a disorganized mess. John and I have been talking about this for years, because I'm a huge Sonos freak and a Sonos user, and Sonos pulls the data, and so they get the benefit of the corrupt data when you're using it. It's, it was always wonderful. Interfaces and personalized recommendations are just really beginning. Even history files are new in this arena. I was just showing Tom that Apple Music doesn't have a history file. Or you can't get to what you just played. So if you leave your house and you go to your car and you want to continue playing what you played, good luck finding it. It is doable, but hard. Human curation and point of view curation is just beginning. The first real music DJ has just gone online on Beats 1. His name's Zane Lowe. It's changing the world already, but it just happened. I think it's three months old. Publishers are still fighting the labels for higher royalty. They're in Washington trying to restructure how they get paid in a digital environment, and the courts are going to decide on what copyright reform is, but obviously they're all very schooled in music copyright, not. <laughs> Few things for sure. Streaming has won a trillion songs, six months. Vinyl, ironically, for those of you who still have your vinyl, is the preferred physical format, and it's working, and the value's going up. There was always going to be a, a coffee table physical victor. Um, I don't know that the industry thought it would be vinyl, and it's mostly for romantics, but it works. As I said, $10 a month is still a fight, which is nuts to me, but whatever. Um, the windowing and tiering I spoke about has not commenced. We're still in the great try it before you buy it era. No one understands blended offerings yet, not even the copyright holders and the content providers. I don't know. I, I asked every digital, digitally savvy <clears throat> label, movie studio head, whatever, do you know how much you get paid in Amazon Prime or Google Play? And they couldn't, ha they have no clue. I said, if I pay $100, and I get all those things, is it based on, is it a flat rate for movies, video games, books, television, music, and it, the $100 is carved up, 
or is it based on usage? And they said they don't know. And I thought, all right. In any case, next few years will be marked by rapid user growth, refinement of these offerings, personalized interfaces, expanding content libraries, confusion and complaining over the money, and lots and lots of action. Thanks. Well, that's a tough act to follow. I don't have a extended Lord of the Rings metaphor for you. Um, so my name is Tom Conrad. I spent 10 years as the um, CTO and um, head of product in engineering um, and design at Pandora. So I thought I would start um, at the beginning. Uh, the first record I ever bought was Sean Cassidy's eponymous debut in 1977. For those of you, I'm glad it's such a cool one. Anyways, I thought maybe you would remember the Do Ron Ron. Amazing, amazing track. You know, this is a thing that happens when you work in the music business. People ask you, like, what was the first record you ever bought? And it's always something cool, unless it's Sean Cassidy. Um, he was on the Hardy Boys television show, which was pretty awesome. Um, but then, they, you know, so, like, you go, maybe you can, like, kind of segue into what was the first concert you ever went to. And I'm pretty sure it was Sha Na Na at the 1981 Ohio State Fair. <laughs> So not, I'm just not winning on this, this dimension. Um, I got a little bit better um, uh, about the time I got to high school. So I was in high school when the CD player first was kind of um, uh, you know, coming into fashion. And um, so I bought my first CD player in 1988. The first CD I ever bought was um, Peter Gabriel's Security, I think, which is, I think is a much cooler, much cooler choice. Um, and uh, somewhere along the way, I, you know, I was kind of that guy, that guy you knew in college who wanted to kind of sit you down in front of their stereo and say, oh, if you like, you know, if you like The Cure, um, you've got to hear Susie and the Banshees, and if you like Susie and the Banshees, you've got to hear The Glove, and um, just kind of bore you to death until you tried to sneak away. Um, uh, so I went to college in, uh, from 1988 to 1992, and just to kind of set this in people's memory, this is before um, the MP3 was invented. The first commercial encoder came out in 1994. Um, this is way before Napster. I remember like kind of getting my paycheck from the, the computer lab that I worked in, and like taking off like my books and my rent and stuff, and figuring out like, okay, I've got you know $45 left. That's that's and measuring it and basically how many CDs I could buy um, with. Uh, with what was left over. Um, and uh, so I was um, a big music nerd, um, very lean-in kind of music fan um, when I came out of college. Um, but the other thing that I was really passionate about was, um, uh, was personal computers. And I, I really went to college. I mean, honestly, I went to college so I could work for Apple. It was like my only goal, which meant I really paid no attention in physics class at all. Um, uh, so in 92, when I graduated, I got my dad's car, and I drove to California, and I got a job at Apple working on the Macintosh. I spent some time um, uh, developing video games in the mid-90s, uh, including a game called You Don't Know Jack that was a little bit popular for a while. And then I ran engineering at Pets.com and nearly destroyed the U.S. economy by myself. Um, <laughs> along the way, um, the CD collection of mine kept big getting bigger and bigger, and um, I was a uh, I mean, I, always, I, I never really sort of participated in the whole Napster early MP3 era. I mean, it always seemed like stealing to me. Um, uh, but I did eventually um, rip all of my CDs. You talked about it, you know, people who can remember that. It took, a, I think it took me about 250 hours to rip all 1,000 of them. And, you know, that meant they ended up in iTunes, and I could put them on my iPod. I could stream them to my stereo with um, this, this little tiny kind of funky device called a squeeze box from a little company called Slim Devices. That was an early competitor to you guys. Um, and, uh, um, but I remember being just really frustrated, and this is about 2003 now. I had done all this work. I would spent all of this time putting my, my music into a computer, and it did almost nothing for me. Um, it wouldn't tell me when new albums came out by my favorite bands. It wouldn't introduce me to other people who had similar music taste. It wouldn't um, make recommendations about other music that I might find interesting based on what it understood about me. It just seemed like this really, really, really stupid jukebox. Um, and so I started thinking about kind of how I could take some of the things that I'd learned developing recommendation systems and consumer software and software for the internet and create um, applications that would... Um, uh, make use of all that kind of technology in the context of music. And 
um, before I go on, I'm going to talk about Pandora a lot. I really, I should remind everybody that I haven't worked there in 15 months. Um, uh, a lot of the team is brand new um, and really, really incredible. A great new CEO, a great new CTO, a great new head of product, um, a great head of strategy that just came in. Um, so I'm going to talk about Pandora a lot, but it's, it's a lot of my perspectives are pretty dated at this point. Um, uh, and certainly, I, I want to make sure that, that uh, they have all the, the room in the world to, to navigate the next 10 years. Um, but in 2004, I met a guy named Tim Westergren who um, had created something called the Music Genome Project. Um, uh, and the idea behind this was to do a rigorous analysis of 100 years of popular music um, and to understand each and every song at the musicological level. So not just you know, what kind of guitars are being, uh, are being played, but, but what does the competition, composition for the guitar look like? How do the, all of the instrumentation come together? There's 40 different attributes that define just the vocal performance in a pop song. So I came along in 2004, met Tim, and he'd been taking this technology and putting it to use, I mean, frankly, kind of in any context where someone would pay him money for it. So he had built kiosks for um, Borders and Best Buy. He had built a website for Tower Records. He'd built an API to plug into the music section of AOL.com. Um, uh, but he'd also, on the back of, of that success, raised some money from the, the venture community for the first time. And um, uh, with that investment came the expectation they bring in some consumer-focused people like myself. And Joe Kennedy was the CEO for a decade. Um, and uh, and build a consumer product. <laughs> More significantly, the question, though, in 2004 when we had the Music Genome Project and nothing else was, what kind of consumer music offering do we want to be when we grow up? And candidly, kind of looking at my own music consumption, I was really excited about building something for a very lean-in music user. I still wanted to solve this problem of I've you know, ripped all of these CDs and let's take all that data that we know about the people that have done that work or have built MP3 collections on their own through theft um, and make you know, additional music recommendations, introduce them to new music, other people that like the same kind of music, bands that are coming to town, and so forth. And <clears throat> Joe Kennedy, uh, the CEO, though, um, made this observation that if you really want to um, impact the world of music at scale in the United States, it's really all about radio, which is a huge surprise to me. But um, still to this day, 80% of all music entertainment in the United States by hours consumed is radio. Just 20% is music that people own. Now, probably the kind of people who come out tonight um, you know, to participate in an evening like this, you're not, you're the exception, you're nothing like the rule, this probably seems like the biggest bunch of bullshit, but this hasn't changed for, you know, for a hundred years. This is, this is what music consumption has looked up for time immemorial. Now it's like 70% terrestrial radio, 10% Pandora now, um, but um, it's still kind of this radio format where you don't have control over what plays, you give it a, kind of a hint about what your musical taste is by maybe selecting a frequency on the FM dial or telling Pandora the name of an artist or song that you love, and <clears throat> the DJs behind the service, whether that's software or humans or some middle ground, which is probably what Clear Channel is, um, uh, make the choices for you. Um, 20% of music um, uh, consumption is kind of the on-demand category. So that might be buying vinyl or CDs or subscribing to a subscription service like Spotify or Apple Music. Um, and so when you look at that, like, well, why is that the case? Why <clears throat> you know, do people get so much of their music entertainment from radio? So fast forward um, to today. Um, about 80 million people tune into Pandora and listen every month. Um, it's a service that's uh, um, only available in the United States. So if we compare it to what that looks like against some of the other properties that you're familiar with, that's a larger audience than Twitter has in the United States. Listeners spend more time listening to Pandora than they spend watching YouTube videos in the US or on Facebook in the US. And of the top 10 mobile applications um, by audience, um, Pandora is the only one that's not made by Google or Facebook. Um, it's almost 10% of all radio, so take all terrestrial radio, satellite radio, and so forth, put it in one big pool, Pandora comes out to be one out of every 10 hours. Pandora is the largest radio station by audience size in every major market in the United States. Um, and uh, Pandora, at this point, I think I, we can safely say, successfully competes with literally everyone because every single company in digital music has at, built at least one, if not two or three Pandora clones, Apple, Google, um, Clear Channel, I mean, who am I forgetting? Everyone. Um, Yahoo, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so, why did it work? Um, well, I think in part it worked because we were a very, very focused company. Um, it wasn't that it was lost on us that there was a big opportunity to reinvent 
the kind of the record store by building something like Spotify or now Apple Music or Rhapsody for that matter. Um, but we just thought it was a big separate problem and we had our, you know, our hands full building something that would reinvent radio. Um, we also focused on making the product incredibly easy to use. We focused um, relentlessly on personalization and, and making sure that the audio experience of Pandora was an exceptional one. I mean, I got beat up a lot as the guy who ran product for not adding features to Pandora. Um, people would constantly come and say, you know, another year has gone by, Tom. Why aren't there four more buttons in the user interface that you can point to and say these were the four big features of, you know, 2009? Um, and what that analysis of Pandora missed is that we were taking all of those resources and plowing them back into making the best playlists in the world. Um, when we launched um, Pandora on the iPhone, uh, this funny thing happened. People kept coming up to me and saying, uh, I really love Pandora on the iPhone. Um, it's incredible. The, play the playlists are so much better than the playlists on the web. This is a curious thing to say because it's exactly the same servers delivering exactly the same playlists. Um, and I was puzzled by it for a while. And uh, I started to develop these theories like, oh, well, maybe like, it's a kind of placebo thing because you have it in your pocket and you take it with you and it feels much more personal and you're just much more engaged in it. It can be part of your life away from the computer. And so you know, all of this, these theories. And then I finally thought to ask one of these people this question. When was the last time you listened to Pandora on the web? And they said, oh, and, you know, in 2005 when you launched. Aha, well, Pandora in 2005 versus Pandora in 2008 is, was not a fair match at all because the playlists were terrible in 2004, and they were getting okay in 2008, and uh, we've made a lot of progress um, since then. Um, uh, we also invested a lot in Ubiquity, um, so it's easy to focus on the success we had on the iPhone and then Android, but we had a huge audience on BlackBerry for the BlackBerry area, era. Um, we were on, um, I keep saying we, I really shouldn't say we, there, on um, you know over 100 distinct automobiles today. Um, and thousands, literally thousands of consumer electronic devices, of which Sonos is, of course, our favorite. Um, and by our, in that sense, I mean my wife and I's. Um, <laughs> um, I just wanted to say, because uh, they ne never would say it about themselves, Mark actually has the distinction of being the very first music entrepreneur uh, in the, in the dot-com sense. So. Uh, I remember sitting with um, Ian Rogers, who was the CEO of Beats Music, and he started up the Beats One radio station that they were just talking about. And uh, Ian told me in his first company, he Mark let him sleep on his couch and rent some space. So uh, Mark was number one. And then uh, the first successful streaming music company, you are, sorry, you are. <laughs> I'm showing my age, I apologize. Uh, uh, and Pandora was unquestionably the first scale streaming music company. I mean, if you look, you listen to the impressive stats, and you, you, sitting in Sonos, you could see it happening, and I'll show you some usage data. I think the more interesting part is, uh, I, I can say from the 12-year journey of Sonos to here, and then the 12 years ahead, it's a real defining, it's a pivot point. Um, in Sonos, we would find people like Tom or Mark who had ripped their music, and then we'd um, explain that you could put it around the house, and then we'd introduce them to a streaming service, not these particular guys, but that's on average what we would do. And there's a complete uh, 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 revolution happening in that we're more and more able to talk about stream the talk in context of the streaming services and that just started happening this year so it's a big change you can see it on all sorts of the data and you can see some of the challenges the industry has because um, I think uh, Bob showed a graph here but um, this is a track this is vinyl, this is cassettes, this is CDs, and of course that's, if you're talking to the label people, they always talk about that point. And uh, then these are downloaded tracks, so everything green and left is purchased. You know, you, uh, you bought the Beatles, 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 all in different formats, right? Um, and, but once you bought it, you weren't going to buy another Beatles uh, CD or whichever. Uh, what was your first album? Yeah, you didn't rebuy that in CD, did you? Mine was Don't Shoot the Piano Player by Elton John. 
Oh, awesome. That's a good That's album. Yeah. Uh, that one is streaming. Now, the funny part of it is it's subscription, okay? So it's not a one-time purchase. It reoccurs. And, you know, if you worked in the software industry, um, and I'm older, I think, than both of these guys, uh, my first job was working at a store, and you put the software in a floppy disk, and you hung it in a plastic bag, and it hung on the wall. Um, and that's what you bought. Um, the software industry switched, I'm sure you all know, to subscription. You now pay monthly or something like that for all your software. You don't get to pay once for that version. And, and it's a better way, because you're, you know, if, you've, if you're in the software business and you know your customers are paying you every month, it's just it's more stable business. If you're a public company, you've got better visibility to the revenue, everything gets better. If you're in the music business, the miracle is pay per play. You know, when when Sonos did its first integration with uh, Rhapsody, um, Rhapsody paid about a penny a track per play. So each time you press play on any track and you picked a track, out went a penny to all the rights holders. Um, now, how the penny got divided up and everything is a whole interesting conversation. And by the way, that predates digital music. There's been fighting over that stuff from the beginning of time between the labels and the artists. Um, but that's a really interesting model, and it's not comparable to these, because over time, a, a, a usage model uh, versus a per play model, you have to make some assumptions because they're apple and oranges. And the industry doesn't even know how to compare them yet. I literally took this out of, uh, I think this came out of the RIAA stuff, but uh, I was telling uh, Tom Conrad earlier when I talked to the Universal CEO, he couldn't even track the Pandora revenue. And Pandora is about a billion dollars in revenue annually, and about 500 million goes to the, the sound exchange, which breaks it up among the labels. And uh, the biggest slice of that 500 million goes to Universal. And, and Universal didn't even know how big that was because when SoundExchange would report it to Universal, they'd report it in a category called Other. And Other was getting bigger, but <laughs> they had no idea what it was until I pointed it out. Uh, so, you know, the industry just going through a, a big change. Um, I would in Entirely agree with Mark, and he and I have been aligned on this. There are more people listening to more music all over the earth than ever before, and he gave you that track number. And it's a, it's a creative process, and uh, it's just how you connect those two is getting redefined. It's not through Tower Records, it's through Pandora and Spotify and Apple Music now. Um, you know, the CD did an interesting thing. We've all heard about it. It really spiked the album sales because, you know, the, you've all run into and you've all heard about the three tracks on the 12-track CD that you didn't want. Um, and, of course, in digital music, that broke it up. So if you want to make an album in this modern day, it better be a good album like when the Beatles made an album or um, when Quadrophenia came out because you're going to have to get the fan to listen to the whole album. They're going to skip the tracks they don't like if they don't fit. Um, I don't think there's anything unhealthy about that. Uh, one of the artists once told me, hey, if I really wanted him to listen to the whole thing, I'd make one track that was 35 minutes. And you know, So what is, in the end, what's the behavior this whole industry is serving? It's serving music listening. And that's been going on for thousands and thousands of years. It'll be happening in thousands of years. It's a creative endeavor. It's hard to make great music. That's all healthy. Um, but what's happening right now is all these music lovers are coming from different places on the planet. So you can see that's why Apple is doing things like the um, Beats One service. So, you know, what's Apple's impact? One of the most positive things I watch is they got the labels to see that global streaming radio was important. They couldn't see that before. Um, you know, they, they just couldn't even see Pandora and they couldn't imagine letting them off the uh, coast of the US. So that's happening. Uh, Google has a wonderful service they've made free and they're working on global. So you're going to see a lot of activity on these fronts. Um, you know, here's a roll-up of services, just for example, Apple Music and Beats One, Spotify, Pandora. 
Google Radio, On Demand, and YouTube, SoundCloud. If you're, a, if you're a music aficionado, SoundCloud's a wonderful service. Deezer, that's a French on-demand service title. That's the one Jay-Z's got, gone after in Norway. Rapster, Napsody, they were the first on-demand. Rapsody really was. Uh, uh, RDO, both of those kind of ran out of stream. Amazon's kind of sitting out of this one. They've got an Amazon Prime music service. If you're a Prime user, you get it, but they don't have Universal. So that's 40% of all recorded music, about 50% of the most popular music. So it doesn't work real well. Slacker, Stitcher, these are radio services in the US.